All right. Once again, happy Friday, Dr. Duncan. Beautiful uh, Baltimore, Maryland. We've got Dr. Conrad Duncan in the studio with us today remotely. Uh, but he is uh, filling up this space back here. And welcome to another edition of Venue Health. Dr. Duncan, thank you so much for sharing your afternoon with us. Thanks for having me again. It is a beautiful Friday in Baltimore, with exception of heat. Um, as you, I, I know you get fried like this regularly, but for us, it's a little bit toasty. A little toasty. Um, <laughs> toasty. But, but it's tough. It's okay. uh, but it's funny. Yesterday in the in the waiting area, the uh, operating room, everybody had blankets on because it was so cold in, in the hospital. I mean, it's like the, I took a picture of it. But, like six people with blankets on because they were so cold. But, eh, right. They're not used to heat around here. Well, it's, uh, you know, you get acclimated to some of that warmth. And, of course, the ORs are kept at a particular temperature, which happened to be on the cooler side because you are under lights and you are gowned up and you're wearing uh, very hot gloves that do not breathe. Uh, they keep you safe. Uh, but <laughs> but when you're done, uh, you know you get a little little sweaty palms and and um, so yes they keep the they keep the ORs on the cool side. So if you're uh, if you're a little bit hot outside, just uh, figure out some time to go down to the operating room because you'll cool off rather quickly. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, we were talking a little bit before we clicked on here this afternoon, Dr. Duncan, and one of the things uh, that came to mind was uh, talking about the robotic sacral corpal pexy. Um, and, and there's a lot of people that do those procedures. Um, it's a very effective procedure. Uh, they use a, a very lightweight Y mesh um, at the apex, and then uh, they've. But but there's all these little nuances that uh, you got to think about. Um, and so, for the for the women out there that are listening to this particular program, and if they go to a specialist, and they mm -hmm. say they're gonna they're going to address uh, your prolapse um, robotically or laparoscopically and they're going to use a very lightweight Y mesh uh, this particular next portion that Dr. Dunk is going to walk you through uh, is very important because he wants to ensure that you have a uh, complete repair and a very successful repair so Dr. Duncan take it away take it away I just want to first start off by saying this is not an attack on the sacral copalpex. This is a, a valid, great procedure. It's not a good procedure. It's a great procedure. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why it might not always be the best procedure. Um, and uh, and there, there are several different factors involved uh, that when you go to have prolapse repair done, and I would say the majority of uterine prolapse, vaginal ball prolapse is going to be addressed with uh, robotic sacral copalpexy when we're talking about the top of the vagina. Um, I don't, I mean, I, that's, that is my sort of general understanding right now, not having the numbers in front of me, but uh, there's not been a huge paradigm shift away from that procedure. Uh, so let's talk about first, as, as you mentioned, uh, or the, the, the difference between laparoscopic and robotic is, 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 is not an important distinction to make. If you're good at the robot, that's what you use. If you're good with regular laparoscopy, that's what you use. So the actual minimally invasive access point isn't so important. So the difference, if someone says, oh, you have to have it robotically as opposed to laparoscopically, that's just not true. Right. Whatever that surgeon is good at, that's what he or she should use. So they're both legitimate. Uh, as you, you could actually make an argument that the laparoscopic slash sometimes called straight sticks or traditional laparoscopy is, is maybe better. 
because there are fewer ports holes. And those, if you had to make an argument, the straight stick way is the better way to go, but only in the hands of someone who can do it well. If you don't do that well, then the robotic is a very close, nice second choice. But let's talk about the sacral cobalt And I know it's a big word, uh, and sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as LSC, laparoscopic sacral cobalpexy, or RSC, robotic sacral cobalpexy. And what, when you hear the word copal, think vagina. And so pexy means suspension, generally. And so we're suspending the vagina. Uh, but when we think of the vagina and we think of prolapse, we always think of the vagina as having three compartments, um, sometimes four, but we generally think, say, three compartments. One where the bladder would be, so that would be on the top. The second would be where the uterus would be. This is a person lying down. This is a cartoon version of a person lying down. And the bladder sits here. The uterus sits here. Oops, let's go this way. And the bowel down here. So three compartments. Yep. One, two, three. And that general cartoon is the simplest way to think about the vagina and its support. Because all three of those compartments have different support structures or different support means of support. And the sacral copalpexy generally addresses in a very efficient and efficacious way, way the apex or where the uterus would be, is or would be. So you can have a hysterectomy or not have a hysterectomy. That's um, not necessary, ne necessary part of the procedure, but where that uterus is or was is the apex or top, and that's what the sacral copalpexy addresses. During that surgery, many surgeons will take that mesh that they use down to the bladder and posteriorly into the rectal area and cover some of the de other defects that we talked about from a laparoscopic or robotic approach. So that's the first thing you're gonna wonder, is, th is that surgery capable of doing that extension of the mesh to cover those other defects? Um, but if the sacral copalpexy is done for just the apex and you present with other defects, such as the bowel or bladder, those may not be addressed with just the sacral copalpexy. So it's important to understand how, how your surgeon, how she or he is going to address those other defects, including one of the other defects that's often not well addressed, is the actual opening to the vagina called the general hiatus. Uh, I guarantee you that's not going to be addressed laparoscopically or robotically. Now, circling back before we even start talking about laparoscopic or robotic procedures, all of our mother organizations will start off by saying, when I say mother organizations, those are the organizations by which we kind of follow the rules because they are the voices for our specialty. And within say sacral copalpexy domains, we have three organizations, all of which tell us that vaginal surgery is safe. So that's the first thing to remember, is that vaginal surgery is a safer way to do things. When I say safer, we're talking about the big ones. We're talking about mortality and morbidity, and va vaginal surgery has less of that, no matter what the procedure is. Um, so those mother organizations, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, AUGS, which is the American Urogynecological Society, and AAGL, which is our minimally invasive society, will all have a position paper stating that fact. So it's not to say everybody should have vaginal surgery all the time. I still do laparoscopic sacral copalpexies when necessary or when indicated. But just remember, it should always be a consideration for every patient undergoing either a robotic or laparoscopic procedure for prolapse. So given that, that sort of fundamental knowledge going into your evaluation, do not think that the doctor is offering you a bad procedure when they talk about a robotic sacral copalpexy. That's not true. It may be the procedure that she is best at doing. It may be the pr procedure that he only knows how to do. If that's the case, the discussion of vaginal approaches should always come up with the surgeon saying, I don't do those, but this is an option for you. And that's where a disservice is sometimes done for our patients who don't understand that 
one, you always have options. And two, even if I don't do a particular procedure, I will always give my patients that option that this is a procedure that is uh, standard of care for, for the problem that you have. I just don't do it. For instance, urethral bulking. I don't, I just don't do them. Um, and so when I talk about stress incontinence, I will always mention urethral bulking and I will always say, I don't do them um, for a number of reasons, but I don't do enough of them to consider myself an expert at it. Right. And therefore I don't do them for dabbling but I will always tell a patient that they can have that procedure and hear the pros and cons of urethral bulking for stress and dominance. So again, patients should be empowered to understand options and select options that fit her the best. Um, again, not to badmouth the sacral colpexy, but just kind of put it in its, well, in the menu of options, which is, which is again, a great apical procedure, does not necessarily address other defects, it may not be the safest procedure, just, even just for the apex. And so, uh, what should the patient be asking or or considering if the if the physician says, "Hey, I'm going to do a robotic approach. I'm going to use a little bit of this very lightweight mesh. I'm going to pick up the apex." What should then be the question by the patient, what, the, what should they ask the physician at that point as far as um, addressing a cystocele, a rectocele, right? Uh, the, you know, maybe they have, maybe, maybe part of the conversation should be that they have some laxity, right? I mean, if you are, if, if you've had, you know, three children and you've had an episiotomy and you know so there's some i guess the, i guess the, the the thing that we want to at least uh, have these ladies have this conversation is that there's besides the apex itself most women have these underlying conditions that right. are that you have to then go down below vaginally and address and so what would that little checklist look like for the for the for that patient yeah that's a great great uh, uh segue into sort of going into your consultation armed with a little knowledge i mean you know dr google could be dangerous but on the other hand you should go into your consultation um and i just i just I, when, when when i sit there and have a patient just leaves everything i say and takes it for at full throttle i'm kind of like yeah i don't feel like i really got a patient who completely understands because patients should always come in knowing something about their condition. That being said, one of the first things a patient should do, and I don't like using the word defect, but that's kind of the word we use, uh, is the apex the only problem, meaning slashes, the uterus or top of the vagina, apex. You may hear all those words used interchangeably. Is that my only problem? Because if that's my only problem, we continue this discussion, and then the next question would be, if that's your only problem, is it safer for you to do this procedure robotically or laparoscopically or transvaginally? Because I understand given equal options, the vaginal approach has less morbidity and mortality than the robotic approach. And if your doctor then says, well, the robotic approach is what I use and this is what I do, then obviously, and the difference between those mortality and morbidity numbers are not huge. The robotic sacral complex is an incredibly safe procedure, especially in the hands of someone who does it well. So don't think, oh, if I have a laparoscopic or robotic procedure, I'm doomed. That's not the case. All things being equal, surgical experience, uh, the pathology that the person's presenting, all things being equal, the vaginal approach is a safer approach. Meaning, if you have a, a surgeon who's adept at both of them, does both of them great, and you have an apical procedure to be done, the vaginal approach is a safer procedure. Now, I would much rather have you have a robotic sacral copalpexy in the hands of someone who does that well than that person being pushed or forced into doing a vaginal procedure that he or she doesn't do often, right. if that makes sense. Yep. So given that, given that first question, is that my only defect? And if it is, then have we considered the vaginal approach? That's kind of all you have to address if it is your only defect. If it's not your only defect, 
the next question would be, how are we going to address the other defects? And a corollary of that is, what is the measurement of my genital hiatus or opening to the vagina? And will we address that? Um, and so if your genital hiatus is measuring six centimeters or five centimeters, uh, and that's at the opening to the vagina, will that be addressed at the time of my sacral colpexy? Oftentimes, doctors will go from the top to the bottom to finish their procedure, and that's fine too. That's perfectly reasonable. But th those, that's what that would be sort of the pathway of questions you'd want to then sort of parse out to your surgeon. So, so you mentioned the the opening. Mm -hmm. So, how is that taken? What are the two? What are the? What's the start point? What's the end point? See, so, because you gave a number, and you gave a medical term the general hiatus, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, if you're a patient, how would they know uh, what, what, what's the physician looking at start, end, and then what is considered within range of, of what it should be, right? And what crosses over into pure cosmetic surgery. Right. So we're, we're, it's a continuum. And we, and we have to be very careful walking that continuum because we don't want to say uh, we're not into the let's create the the barbie vagina for everybody that's not what we're talking about and I, I use that term somewhat derogatory but it's often a term that's batted around in circles in i won't say bashing cosmetic surgery but sort of in that in that realm we don't we're not we're not talking about that we're talking about symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse prolapse that bothers the patient right so let's talk a little bit about the general hiatus. Again, the general hiatus is the medical term for basically the opening of the vagina. And um, the, you know, you've, uh, some people also hear the term mommy makeover and things like that. What we really want to do is address those issues that keep the patient from coming back to see me. And there's some, and you'll find the spectrum of attention to the general hiatus for surgeons, let alone patients. It's all over the map with patients because they don't know what to say, what to say or what to ask for, or even what to look for. But even among surgeons, uh, pelvic reconstructive surgeons, the consensus isn't there on what to do with a general hiatus. Now, there's some good data, some good research that says by closing the general hiatus to a certain point, we're going to be decreasing the chances of you coming back to see me for prolapse. And I like to sort of use the analogy that if, if someone has an opening like this, uh, you know, seven centimeters, and they come to me with major prolapse, and that prolapse has literally forced the opening of the vagina to be pushed open for long periods of time, because sometimes patients will have prolapse for years, and they have a general hiatus of seven, seven centimeters. So pause, so, so pause there. So seven centimeters, circumference, top to bottom, left to right. What what is your what is your measuring point? Thanks for stopping me. That the measuring point is from the opening of the urethra where the urine comes out to the bottom of the vagina. So if this is the this is the opening of the vagina. Yep. The urethra is here. It's a measurement to the bottom. And so it's a straight line a straight vertical or up and down line. And to have a general hiatus of six or seven centimeters is not that uncommon. And I'm using this extreme example to give it, to sort of let patients understand that when we think about repairs, we're thinking along a continuum. And this is out to eight or nine centimeters answers that that needs to be fixed. And I'm that person who had kids, but I'm gonna do it with also a closing of the general hiatus to a, to a number. And then you're, it'll get back to your question, what is that number? To a number that's reasonable. And for different patients, that's a different number. Right. For different surgeons, that's a different number. So I always like to say, the surgeon and the patient, they need to be on the same page, whatever that number might be, before you go into surgery. Is the, is the number, I don't touch the general hiatus, or your general hiatus is fine, and you know, in a perfectly great sexual function, and there's no concern for the general hiatus, the question then turns on, is Closing the general hiatus some going to help prevent a recurrence of prolapse. 
And the answer is, well, it depends again, how big the general hiatus is. So again, going back to that example where I have a six or seven centimeter general hiatus with a ton of prolapse, if I don't close that general hiatus some, I've increased her risk to come back and see me. And I like to sort of use just basic physics. If I have an opening like this, I might be inviting prolapse back. If I have an opening like this, like none at all, you're not gonna have prolapse again. That's called a copocleisis. Right. And obviously most patients want something in between. Right. Uh, so as a general rule, two finger breaths under relaxation without discomfort is our sort of target point. There are nuanced changes because we have patients who don't may not use the vagina as a receptive organ. We have patients who have partners that are extraordinarily, extraordinarily large. We have patients that are having no problems sexually, so that patient may have a general hiatus that's a little bit larger than the two finger breaths because we don't want to have vaginal constriction or difficulty or painful intercourse after repairing the general hiatus because repairing the general hiatus is also not a free lunch. There are complications that can arise. So, so it's a discussion that needs to be had. The patient needs to know, is it abnormal? You need to hear back from the patient. Well, are you, the surgeon has to chime in on whether he or she thinks that might be a way to prevent recurrence. So it's a complicated issue, but one that, again, needs to be addressed. The, the worst thing you do is sort of ignore the issue. Right. But the general hiatus or opening of the vagina should always be addressed in the complete evaluation of a patient with prolapse. So the you're talking about trying to keep the prolapse from coming back right and so what type of prolapse would they be experiencing that you're trying to uh, ensure that doesn't come back well that's a great question but there and i generally hold i uh, kind of want to put that in two different categories okay. one is prolapse as a failure of something that i fixed and failures occur. So if I put the apex apex back up or top of the vagina or uterus, and two years later, she comes in and the top of the vagina, apex, uterus is back down at the opening of the vagina, that's a failure. That's a straight up recurrence of what I tried to fix. And failures, even in the most experienced hands, do occur. Don't let any surgeon ever tell you that she or he does not have failures. They occur. So that's the first thing is, is that we will have failures of and just something that we tried to fix and that's just a failed surgical procedure. We also have recurrences or people showing up with symptomatic prolapse from an area that was not fixed during the first surgery. Again, think of vector physics. If I have a tube and I've got forces hitting it all over the place, trying to push it out, trying to turn it inside out and I fix one area what does that do to the forces that are trying to put it out? It concentrates them on the areas that I didn't do anything with. So having a recurrence or a new prolapse after repairing another prolapse can also occur. So those are two different ways a patient might come back and say, hey, doc, what's this problem I have now that I, you know, I, I thought you were going to fix? Right. And it, my job is to figure out whether it's a failure of my first procedure or it's a new Relax. Right. Wherever that um, is looking for the weak point, and it's going to try to find it and exploit it, and so now you have to go back and correct yeah. that 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 defect uh, once again. Um, so the the other thing that we were chatting about here before we jumped on was uh, your hysteropexy. Um, mm -hmm. Walk me through. I think you had a. a Kind of an interesting, I guess, uh, case report. If we were, if we were teaching uh, residents, uh, this would be something that we would talk about on a Monday. Yeah, it's a great case report. Um, two days ago, I had a a woman come in. Well, she came in the office several several weeks ago, of course, but uh, several a couple months ago. But had her in the OR two days ago, who came and presented for with symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse and this also just a sidebar we never operate on patients who are not symptomatic so that's you know that's one thing oh, we rarely rarely do um but she came in with symptomatic prolapse and this is a patient i had performed a laparoscopic sacral colpopexy on five years ago okay and um uh, and i think we were doing a bso at the time 
uh, I can't remember whether it was a breast, she had actually sub, a stomach cancer as well as a family history of ovarian cancer. So we were doing a prophylactic removal of her ovaries five years ago, which is one of the reasons why we were pushing, doing the, or why we were sort of gearing ourselves to do the, the laparoscopic approach rather than the vaginal approach. Right. Because as you remember, I mentioned there might be times when we do laparoscopic work simply because it's the better option for that patient, and that's what we did. She wanted to preserve her uterus, and so we did what's called a hysteropexy, which means it takes the top of the vagina where the uterus is and brings up that top of the vagina while preserving the uterus. Perfectly legitimate procedure. Um, uh, the, you know, removing the uterus, it's not the uterus's fault that it's falling out. It's just the top of the vagina that's falling out, and the uterus happens to be the organ behind it. But preserving your uterus or keeping your uterus is a perfect legitimate legitimate option when doing a sacrocopal pexy, robotically or laparoscopic. So she wanted to preserve her uterus. So came in and we did a I, I did a transvaginal repair of her symptomatic prolapse, which was new massive anterior slash bladder prolapse. When I say massive, it was past the introitus or opening of the vagina, but the apex was still pretty decent. We were doing, I did, so I fixed her pro, symptomatic prolapse vaginally, but we were also doing a laparoscopy because she had chronic pelvic pain. Uh, uh, and you know, we, so we, I did a diagnostic laparoscopy with anticipation of finding adhesions and or some, tor some type, some, some pathology. Right. And I looked in and it was a very, very interesting case because in doing the hysteropexy, we wrapped the mesh around the basically top of this the sort of the where the cervix and uterus meet laparoscopically and then we pull that whole thing up and in doing so we don't bother the vessels coming into the uterus they come in from the side we kind of lay this graft around them and bring the whole thing up the uterus for this woman was it looked like when the, the, the medical community that I'm speaking to understand this looked like a, a small degenerating fibroid, about four centimeters, five centimeters in size. It had that pale, discolored, mushy appearance of a degenerating fibroid, but it was her uterus. And this little lump of material uh, was completely detached from all of its support structure. So it was literally just attached to the side of the mesh, mm. which was buried retroperitoneally. So literally, the mesh had strangled, what, what I believe had happened, the mesh had strangled enough blood supply to right. the uterus that over the last five years, this uterus went underwent a degenerative, degenerative yeah. changes consistent with what we see with a degenerating fibroid. It, it died uh, off. It, yeah, it basically, is, it is it in the process of dying off. Right. Now, unfortunately, and I always, when I, when I have a case that I have to scratch my little bald head about, I say, you know, what could I have done better or differently? I'm, I'm now facing a, a dilemma. Do I remove this or do I leave it in? Um, I left it in situ for a couple of reasons. One, I, you know, maybe it was her, 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 her bladder prolapse, which was causing her pain. As, as we know, the pelvis, they poor witness the pain. It's a saying that when someone has pain in the pelvis, we just don't, you know, we can guess. Right. And figure out where it comes from. We just don't know. So my first thought was, let's just hope that fixing her bladder prolapse fixes her pain. Secondly, I could not recall whether this was a patient when we did the hysteropexy was particularly wet to her uterus, meaning some people want to keep their parts, all their parts, no matter what. Some people are indifferent and some people are, get it out of here. And right. we have to respect that entire spectrum. And I didn't know at the time whether this patient was someone who would have said, oh, yeah, it looks like it was a problem to take it out. Or it was a patient that I really want to keep my uterus. And having a uterus that I felt was undergoing slow degenerative changes isn't a major issue. So I let her keep it. Um, uh, post obviously right now she's doing really well. and. Uh, the pain seems to be greatly improved, so hopefully it was just the prolapse. But it's just a reminder that even in situations where we're using mesh for hysteropexy, it's not as benign as we'd like to think. 
when doing that robotic or laparoscopic sacral cobalt test. I might digress just for a second to some of the worst cases I've ever seen in my practice deal with mesh that has literally sawed through the colon over time right. into the descending colon and just basically cut its way into the colon. Uh, I've had two cases like that. And so so it's it's not a totally benign piece of graph when you're doing a laparoscopic or robotic sacral complex. And when I do them, I generally try to use a biologic grafting when I do my sacral complexes now. Um, is it as good as mesh? We don't know. Some small series say yes, but it hasn't been studied with enough, with enough um, <clears throat> interest to say it's as good as mesh, because mesh does work. Right. It just may have some complications. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Definitely. Um, so, so in that scenario, you took pictures, you document it, um, now you at least have a, a, a course of action if, if you want to go back in and take your uterus, right, for, for, for that particular patient? It would be, yeah. It would probably be a very easy procedure in that it looked like it was just sort of, let me detach that from the, let me detach that from the mesh that it's stuck to and go down the surface. I, I wasn't quite sure what I would run into, but again, it should be a pretty straightforward procedure if in, if she needs, if she wants to have that done. Right. In other words, we'll do that if her pain doesn't get better or isn't markedly improved. Uh, if her pain steadily improves, we'll just leave it alone and, and just follow it periodically with the uh, ultrasound. Right. Beautiful. Um, yeah. No, it was a, I, I, I think we unpacked uh, a lot of, of little little touch points and uh, hopefully for the ladies that uh, are, are watching this or will watch this that you have an opportunity to uh, certainly take some notes about uh, that Q&A type of question just because you know a you're never taught this uh, right. ever <laughs> in, in, in any of your classes your health classes uh, and the fact is, is that, uh, you know, none of these conversations are really shared. So many times the first time, you know, you walk into a specialist, sometimes you're going to have these conversations with, uh, with a physical therapist that specializes in pelvic floor. Um, and they're great to be able to, you know, talk about some of these, uh, these Q&A, right? They, many times the physical therapists know who's getting some great outcomes right? in, in, in the community um, because of the patients that they, that they see. So um, that, that's another resource. And, of course, many of, you know, many times, just like in your practice, uh, you've got, you know, nurse practitioner that is going to see a lot of the patients prior to them seeing yourself um, or, you know, having a repair done in the operating room. So the nurse practitioner, the PA, another great source of information um, and Q&A uh, because they do uh, many times then follow the patients um, after the surgery. And so they're, they're also willing to sit down and chat with you about that. Uh, any other interesting things that happened this week just because uh you know we're closing out on friday uh i think you were pretty you were pretty busy this week i don't finish summer physics that's what that's <laughs> so <laughs> bring up a good reminder that, that that the things that you you learn or don't learn in class health class or even on the internet may not these that's why these podcasts are so important and the q and a's are so important because we will sometimes let you know i mean I tell my patients always when we're finished by a consult I, and look at them and say, did you ask me if I'm very good at this or how many of these have I done? And it's, a, it's amazing. Patients never cross their mind. I'm like, you know, every time you go to a surgeon, you need to ask him or her, do you do this a lot? Right. Do you, are you, are you any good at this? I mean, because it's amazing that you may have someone doing something for the 10th or 11th time that maybe the person next door does has done hundreds a year. Right. So, uh, the rule of Johnny does best what Johnny does most is uh, is generally applicable in surgery. Uh, 
And these podcasts can help you uh, pull back the onion skin where, where, you know, it's not a blue wall, but we are somewhat protective within medicine to say, let everybody just do their thing. And don't ask me too many questions about my qualifications or my skill set. And reality is that's just not the case, especially when it comes to reconstructing the pelvis. There's so many different options and so many different opinions, so many different studies and, uh, and, and dogmatic uh, views about what's absolutely right and what's wrong. And that's just, you know, it's a very difficult uh, landscape to navigate. And, uh, to navigate. and so it's, it's very, it's very important to listen to these podcasts to talk to doctors and sort of say, what should I be asking? So that's why I love when you say, you know, what, what's the next question this patient should ask. Right. And uh, for me, this is, you know, it's kind of like, if you're a mechanic taking in your car, you know, what questions to ask. Uh, if you're, a, a, you know, Joe or Jane consumer, you just take it in and hope they fix it and fix it right and don't overcharge you. And that's just what we, that's not the way medicine should be. Right, right. So we want to, we want to empower women to be able to ask intelligent questions, have their little check sheet, um, you know, before they go into some of these consultations because they're going to, they're, they're then going to have a better sense at, uh, what's what's going what they're going to experience if they decide to go through with the surgery in essence um final final comment though uh we'll we'll leave with the fact that you also can do telemedicine right Absolutely. Yes. um so if you're interested in in booking uh some time with dr duncan uh, you can go to his website at conradduncanmd.com. Um, you can send in an inquiry and someone from the office will reach out to you uh, and be able to schedule it um, because you, you might have a, another opinion, um, you know, from different than you're someone that's in your backyard. And, of course, uh, you have people that do come in, they fly in from, uh, all around the country to uh, be able to experience your expertise and your technique uh, without using any mesh. Uh, and so if women are seeking that, they can certainly look you up and get a hold of you and, and have a little a little video chat like we're doing today. And I'm not the only one. There are plenty of, of, of very experienced doctors and throughout the country that if, you know, I can chat with you about anything and steer you in the right direction. So it's a, it's a, it's a great world out there for options and, uh, but just don't go into blind, go in blindly and have done what's just told to you to have to do. Right. A lot of different ways to approach it. We want to give these ladies uh, a lot of education and different techniques that they could be considering. Uh, and at the end of the day, we want them to be happy, healthy, have a better quality of life, and, and enjoy all the things that this world has to offer for us. Um, so, Dr. Duncan, thank you again for taking time on a Friday. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and look forward to catching up with you next week. Thanks for having me on again. It's good to always see you, not in person, but on video. And we'll chat again. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.